This is a Triple J podcast. Hello, welcome back to Science with Dr. Carl, where this week we were joined by radio astronomer and science communicator, Dr. Laura Dreesen from the University of Sydney. Laura absolutely blew my mind in this episode. We found out about spaghettification, whether there is beef between astronomers and astrologers, and if shooting stars are happening in real time. I'm Lucy Smith. Let's get into it. This morning we have a very exciting guest joining us on this here Thursday, Dr. Laura Dreesen from the University of Sydney, who is a radio astronomer, science communicator. And Laura, you are using some of the biggest telescopes to look at the stars, but these are some of the biggest telescopes in the world. Tell us a bit about the work that you do. They are, and I'm even more excited to say that a lot of them are here in Australia. Yes. And most people don't know that. We have an absolutely fantastic big telescope over in Western Australia, about eight hours from Perth, called ASCAP, as well as a couple of other absolutely fantastic instruments over there. So it's really exciting to be able to use Australian instruments. We love right being here. the best and, and doing the biggest. We really, yes. we really are, and I think we don't talk about it, well, because most of our telescopes are really far away from people, so you you can't just like go for a drive and see a telescope. A so it's a bit it. hard to say, we're the best. Trust us. <laughs> you can't see the telescopes, but trust me, they're there. So we really are the top of the world with radio astronomy. So what have you been looking at recently? So I do a couple of things. Like most scientists, I can't be contained, but I mainly work on searching for radio stars and searching for mystery things, particularly we call them transients. And these are things that flash, appear, disappear. We see them once, maybe never again, or we see them a few times. So those are the sort of the main areas that I investigate. What is a radio star? So it's a star that emits radio light. I know we're on the radio, but radio is actually kind of light, not sound. So it's the lowest frequency of light, very low energy. So if you go down to red and then you keep going to infrared, then you go to millimetre, then to microwave, and then your radio. So it's right down the bottom. And it basically tells us that these stars have big magnetic fields. So they're like giant magnets. Our sun is a radio star, but only because it's so close. If we put it a bit further away, we wouldn't be able to see it. So as far as radio stars, it's a bit of a small fry. But the stars that I'm talking about have huge magnetic fields, big plasma bursts, lots of exciting things happening with these stars. Wow. Ah, now, I should explain here that uh, astronomers are weird. So uh, yes. uh, first, firstly, uh, Dr. Astronomer, how many elements are there in a periodic table? Well, for, for scientists, there's only a couple. It's uh, only three and, three, and most of them three, are metals. Three, okay. So... Everybody else thinks that there's 90-something elements in uranium and gold and lead and all that sort of stuff. And you think that there's three. There's mm-hmm. hydrogen yep. and, helium and helium and... And metal. And everything else. Okay, <laughs> yes. that's, okay. That, that, that's the first odd thing about astronomers. The second one is that you call that entire electromagnetic spectrum, you know, uh, microwaves and TV and radio and ultraviolet and gamma rays, you call it... Light, yes, whereas everybody else in the universe calls light the stuff that you can see with your eyeball. Yep, that's it. Okay, now now, now we're going to come to the shameful secret that we uncovered a while ago. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how many radio astronomers are there in the world? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's a few hundred radio astronomers. A few hundred, okay. And when we did our podcast a few years ago on Shirtloads of Science, Mm -hmm. Dr. Laura, how many radio stars are there that we knew back then? Only a couple of hundred. So, I mean, there's probably still more radio astronomers, but... There's more, there's radio, more radio astronomers, astronomers than yes. there are. So, so what, do you sort of decide, look, I'll spend the next 10 years doing this while I go off and then, then I'll have a cup of coffee and then come back in 10 years? No. Well, yes. I mean, I was a student for a while there, so I did have to come back a little bit later. But there's more <laughs> than just radio stars. There's also galaxies. Yes. One of the key things that radio astronomers love to look at, and we can't really avoid looking at them, which is one of my problems, is black holes. Black holes, if you, if you look up at the night sky, you, we see dots and they're almost all stars. Our radio telescopes also see heaps of dots and they're almost all black holes at the centres of very distant galaxies. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we should dive in, oh, uh, dive straight into the questions for you. As an yes, let's you've, do it. you have a real page. Oh, by the way, how many radio stars do we know now, maybe? So there's about three to 400 before this moment, but and I've been working for the last couple of years on a project to find new ones, and I've more than doubled that number in the last couple of on. years of research. You, an mm-hmm. individual person, yep. you have doubled... You and your team. Yes, and the, the excellent team that I work with. Have doubled mm-hmm. what we know. Yes. Oh, my wow. God. Big it up for Laura. Hooray for Laura. Yeah. Okay. Also, Bailey, who's texting, saying you, Laura, are mm-hmm. the radio star. 
Oh, wow, well, thank I know. you. I know. <laughs> I am also a superstar of STEM from Science and Technology Australia, so I am also a superstar. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're making the rest of us look bad. <laughs> okay, we've got Lara in Collaroy here. Now, Lara, you're kicking us off. What's your question? Yeah, hi, doctors. Um, I'm wondering if we see stars in the past, do we see shooting stars in the past or real time? I absolutely love this question. Thank you for the question, doctor. Um, so this tags into a few different physics things. And we, we, you're right, we do see stars in the past. Even our own sun, the light that you're seeing from the sun right now is actually from eight minutes ago. So we're definitely seeing stars in the past. The closest star is Proxima Centauri. Dr. Carl, you might have to tag in with the exact distance for that four one. Four and a bit light years. Four and a bit light years. So Proxima Centauri, we, when we see light from that, it took four years to get to us. But the key difference here is that shooting stars aren't stars. It's a little astronomy quirk that we tend to name things really badly. It's one of the things that we do. We're very good at it. And a shooting star is actually a lump of something rock from space that's hit our atmosphere and burned up. So we are seeing that very close to real time. So time still, the light still takes time to travel to us from the atmosphere to Earth, but it's a really short amount of time. So shooting stars are so close to us and they're lumps of rock burning up. Oh, But there have been cases of people seeing a shooting star which becomes visible at maybe 90 kilometres up and simultaneously hearing a crackling. Ooh. And I, I, I emphasise simultaneously because I had instruments and it turned out that it was putting out radio waves that were picked up by a barbed wire fence about 10 metres from them and then transmitting only the 10 metres to them rather than 90 kilometres down. I was going to say, because sound is so much slower than light, I'd expect that you'd hear the, if you were to hear something, that that, that sound would be slower. But well, if it's actually the radio waves, sure. then it's light. If it's 90 kilometres, then that's uh, multiply that by three, 270 seconds. That's a couple of minutes. Exactly. Wow. We've got Paul in Sydney here. Dr. Paul, you got Hi. a question about telescopes. Hi, doctors. Uh, just wondering, is it true that there's not a telescope powerful enough on Earth to see the remnants of the lunar missions on uh, the moon? Uh, that is true. The telescopes are very powerful and they're also far away. However, we have a less powerful telescope, smaller, in orbit around the moon. So look up LRO on Wikipedia, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it's not very powerful, but it is awfully close. And it has seen the things left behind by the, astron- by the astronauts on missions, what is it, 11 to 16 or 17. They're only six anyway. Mm-hmm. All right. Does that answer your question? It does. And hopefully that proves that we actually went there. Well, it's going to be hard for the, the moon landing deniers to, keep, to have a job because as we keep on landing stuff on the moon and end up going there, they'll say, oh, you're lying. They do say that the astronauts or LIBE, the flat earthers, because they say that there's only the firmament above us at 200 kilometres and there's no such thing as the sun or the moon or astronomy, and the GPS comes from giant balloons that they have hanging in the air that they don't tell us about. They pretend they're satellites. Do you remember that time we had a NASA astronaut on and someone said, what would you say to someone who believes the Earth is flat? And she goes, I've seen it. (laughs) (laughs) I've seen it. Just straight up. We've got Brayden in Warrigal here. Brayden, you have a question about black holes for Laura. What's up? Yes, g'day, doctors. Um, I've got a question uh, concerning black holes. So when you go through the black hole, what's actually on the other side? Like, I've got no clue, but then it's like, how do you know as well? Mm. Has anyone ever been through a black hole or have you sent a a ship through or anything? I love this question. I love it. What a fantastic question. So there's a few things. This is another case of astronomers being really bad at naming things. So when we think of the term hole, we think of something that you can go through, like a hole in a piece of paper or the hole that you put your arm in in your sleeve. But a black hole is not a hole at all. Not that kind of hole anyway. So the idea that we can go through it is just, it's just not something that we can do because a black hole is actually a whole lot of mass in zero space. So it would be like saying, how are you going to go through a bowling ball? We can't do that. Mm. Also, I'd suggest you don't try. That's definitely a don't try this at home kind of situation. But we do have an idea of what happens when we get too close to a black hole, which an answer to one of your questions, we can't do. The closest black hole is quite a few hundred light years away. I think it's Gaia black hole one with some numbers after that because another astronomer thing. So we can't do that and we've never sent anything anywhere near a black hole, as far as we know anyway. Um, So when you get close to a black hole, something called spaghettification (gasps) happens, which is one of my favourite things, where you get 
pulled and stretched so much that you get stretched out and stretched out into spaghetti. What wow. about ER and EPR and a nice stone rosen bridge? Oh, now we're talking wormholes, are we? <laughs> so wormholes is something theorised where it sort of is a, a, I guess a tunnel is how I sort of think about it, connecting two points in space that you otherwise wouldn't be able to connect. Um, they're theorised. I don't think we know we have any proof at all that they, they truly exist. It's one of those fun maths problems. Um, and I suppose you could, if they existed, use one to get too close to a black hole. But again, spaghettification is not a way of staying alive for very long. Um, I think also by the time you get that close, you're also not doing so well anyway. So I wouldn't recommend it. Has anything ever been spaghettified? Do we know this? Yes, we see stars get too close to black holes all the time. So we, I, I'm not sure if spaghettification is the right way that we think about it as astronomers. We call it accretion, where a black hole, that's the, the process of sucking things in, where a black hole pulls things on and it goes sort of around the black hole like water going down the drain. So that's, that's almost the exact visual that you can imagine. Um, and this happens when stars get too close. So black holes aren't pulling everything in. It's only if you get too close, just like we're being held onto the earth right now. But if we went away from the earth, then the gravity isn't pulling us down anymore. So we do see stars and it's called tidal disruption events if you wanted to Google it. Didn't we accidentally accidentally discover the brightest object in the universe a while ago? We did. I think that was another just, was that a just wonderful space telescope result? So, and I think it was a black hole, a distant black hole that was doing this, it's accretion thing. So when black holes um, eat these stars, lots of interesting things happen. And some of them, we don't actually know why. One of those things is, is that these big jets of really, really bright light come out of the black hole. And again, we don't know why this is happening. So that means astronomers are still in a job, thank goodness. But it's incredibly bright. And I think that might be, don't quote me on this, but I think that might be what happened with that black hole. And it's eating one solar system per day. Yep. So and, it's not a hungry black hole like uh, our one. No. And, and <laughs> the jets are sometimes, but let, let me give you an idea of the size. Uh, it takes uh, one and a half seconds to get to the moon at the speed of light. That's as far as we've ever got. Um, the nearest star is four light years away. These jets are sometimes 10,000 light years long. Now we've got Rachel in Airlie Beach. Rach, you got a gift uh, for your birthday. What was it? Yes, it was um, a picture of the stars and it was apparently what the stars looked like at the exact location I was born, at the, the night I was born, but it was 50 years ago. So I was wondering... Is this something that they can do? And if so, how? Or could it have just been a scam for a present idea? Oh. Well, luckily <laughs> for you. No, luckily for you, Dr. Rachel, I think this is 100% real. I mean, I can't speak for your exact picture because, of course, we'd have to check. We'd have to do the maths. Yeah. But luckily, we have a really good understanding of the orbit of the Earth and also the angle that it's on and where you are. If you have the coordinates of where you are and the time, then, yes, yeah. we can wind back that clock and work it out. In fact, there's something called Stellarium where you can actually put in your, your coordinates on Earth and it will show you what the night sky looks like and you can also give it a time. Oh. So you can also work out, you know, when and where and see what was above you and even what was below you and on your favourite holiday, what did the stars look like at that date and time. So we absolutely can. I can't say if, if your particular picture is absolutely correct, but I would say not a scam because it's a, a known problem with a bit of maths. You good, Rach? Mm -hmm. You're good. That's amazing. Oh, cool. That'd be a lovely anniversary present. It is. It's really nice. What did nice. the night sky look like on your first date with someone? Yes. Oh. And they're usually framed up all beautifully, so it is a nice one. Okay, that's gorgeous. Now, Dr. Carl, I think we've got one which you might be able to speak to. Peter and Victoria, let's hope this doesn't happen, but hypothetically, you've got a question. Hey, doctors. So my question is, if I was to be choking on an ice cube... Who would win? Would the ice melt first and I'd be okay or would I choke to death? Ah, so it turns out that we humans are the only animal that can choke to death. Really? Because other animals have two separate pathways that do not cross over in the way that ours do. And the price, the reason that we've incurred that is that we have shifted our larynx to a different place with evolution and we can speak clearly and articulate words and come out with all sorts of different sounds. So the price of speech is that we can choke to death. However, there is a slight disclaimer in that babies can suck 
and talk at the same time because the edges of their larynx have got a little fold so they can keep on breathing and milk can go down and so they can suck and breathe at the same time. In the case of ice, I had once a terrible experience of swallowing a bit of ice and I could feel this cold spot in my lungs and never before and never since have I ever felt this cold spot in the middle of my chest as the ice gradually melted. So in your case, it's sort of maybe one will win, one or the other. If it's just big enough to slide out of the way, you'd survive. Otherwise, you wouldn't. I would not recommend this experiment at home. Yeah. Interesting thought experiment. Did, how did you come up with the idea, by the way? Oh, I was just having some ice the other day and I just <laughs> wondered about it. And you went, huh, imagine the worst yeah, happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so... so the ice would most likely take longer to melt than... Um, if it was a big I lump of ice, it could jam in and you could choke to death. You only need to have... Oh, no, hang on. With a choke hold, you stop and never do this. A choke hold leads to a high incidence of strokes later on mm. and a chokehold will make somebody unconscious in 15 seconds. Don't do it in martial arts. The cops shouldn't do it. Nobody should ever do the chokehold. It's a bad thing. So the chokehold causes unconsciousness in four in 15 seconds because you're stopping the blood, which is still carrying oxygen. But if you run out of air, you'll still stay alive for four minutes because your heart is still beating and bringing oxygenated blood at lower levels but still oxygenated to your brain. So you've got four minutes. So you've got four minutes from going unconscious to uh, having the ice melt and then slipping down and then you're okay. Okay, that's okay. kind of promising, but let's hope that's never something we need to think about, Pete. Yeah, cool. All right. <laughs> hey, Laura, I wanted to ask you, when did you become interested in astronomy and space and know that that was a career path you wanted to take? Well, I think those are two different questions. So apparently this is, you know, mums are very reliable narrators, but um, I went to a mini blow-up planetarium in my local library, Lilydale Library for anyone who knows that area. Um, And after that, when I was four years old, I came out and that was just it. And I remember doing primary school projects on Pluto before, while it was still a planet and things like that. Um, But it wasn't until I was 17 and I attended the Professor Harry Messel International Science School at the University of Sydney during year 11 that I saw Professor Geraint Lewis give a talk. And that was the moment where I actually went, wait, that guy, he does this every day. Like I could actually be an astronomer and get every paid day. for it. Exactly. Yeah. So I sort of knew I loved space, but I thought maybe I'd be something else, like a medical doctor or something like that who has a telescope. Mm. So someone who just, you know, dabbles in space. But it was that moment, that light bulb moment that I went, wait, you can actually do that every wow. day. Yeah. yeah. So, so the motto of the philosopher is, I think, therefore I am. And the motto of the scientist is, I think, Therefore, I get paid. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or in my case, I program before yep. I get paid. Yes. <laughs> well, there's one area that you get asked about a lot. Vivian in Ngunnawal Country, what's your question for Dr. Laura? Good morning, doctors. Um, I just want to know if there's a scientific basis for astrology. You know, you constantly you hear th- phrases like, oh, the moon was in Venus when you were born, so you're going to inherit these sorts of traits. Is there actually an astrophysiological basis for it? Mm. So I get this question a lot and it's a sort of question around like you've asked me about astrology, lock the doors, you're about to hear some astronomy um, because, you know, people often use it as a bit of a gotcha but then I, I, you know, I can always make it astronomy. So I would say as far as the planets influencing you that's less likely. Um, But some planets do. There's ideas about whether Jupiter, for example, um, either maybe pushes asteroids towards Earth or deflects them away. We haven't really decided, but that's definitely a way that the planets influence life on Earth, for example. And all the orbits as well, the way that the orbits of the planets work mean that we're in a nice stable spot. So that is a way that the planets do affect life, of course, because we need to be right here, right now for life to happen. Uh, but But astrology is based on the motion of the stars and where they were at a particular time. So astrology was developed during ancient Greek times, which was a few thousand years ago. And they said that your star sign of these dates based on when your constellation on the sky rose and set. But the key thing here is the Greeks did a couple of sneaky things. They didn't like the number 13, but there are in fact 13 constellations along the plane that they chose for these constellations. The 13th is called Ophiuchus, which 
I'm sure there's other astronomers going, Laura, that's not how you pronounce that, but we're going with it. Um, and also things have moved on the sky since 3,000 years ago. So actually if, if the Greeks were going to design astrology today, those dates would be different. Mm. So I'm not saying things have changed, but just that if they did that calculation today, things would be different in your dates and your star sign would be different. I would be, I'm Aquarius based on the Greek um, dates, but if we calculated it today, I would be a Capricorn. Oh, okay. And whenever they do the studies to try to find out if there's a relationship between your personality and the stars, they never find a link. And they, it's a standard thing done in first year psychology where they hand out a paper and say, look, we know, that, is, is Laura here? Yeah. Is Isabel here? Is Lucy here? Okay. Uh, this is for you. And they give, they say, this is a profile of you based on your birthday, can you tell us if it's accurate or not? And it says things like, you're really kind and occasionally you, you, you don't suffer fools, but overwhelmingly you're really nice and you're rooted to the ground solidly, but you f- your dreams float like a cloud. And they say all of these things that are vaguely complementary and contradicting each other. And at the end they say, now hand them in, tick if it's right. And everybody says, and they describe it exactly. And they all got the same one. Mm. It wasn't individual for each astrology cycle. It was just purely the same one all the way through. And, and we've done so many studies over and over. It's nice to belong to a group, though. Yeah. I yes. think that's what we like. As a psychological thing, I'm not a psychologist, but it is nice to feel like you identify with a group of people, regardless of kind of what that group is. So I think it is nice. Zach said, is there beef between astrologers and astronomers? I mean, to be honest, I don't think we interact that much. So I don't, I don't really think that we're there, there particularly is. I think it depends because um, I, I try and bring in the astronomy really. And, you know, like another thing, the line across the sky is called the ecliptic and it's the plane of the planets and that's where all the constellations are that they chose. So that's, you know, fun. So I actually, when people ask me about astrology, I'm happy because it means I can talk more about space. I consider any question about space to just be an opening for you to learn something. Oh. So I'm not really bothered by it. Can I ask you, is the ecliptic where the plane, the plants will go, is that roughly lined up with the equator of the sun? It's roughly lined up with the equator of the sun, not the earth, because as we know, the earth's got a little bit of a tilt about 21 to 24 degrees. Um, that, so it's not exactly that line. And that's why I think that that ecliptic, that line moves, because as the earth goes around the sun, our angle means that the sun is tilted. So otherwise it would be the same dates all the time. If everything was aligned beautifully and we were exactly lined up with that same plane of the sky, there wouldn't be star signs because all they would be at the same place basically all the time. So that wouldn't help us. So it's all about the angle. We've got Ben in Canberra here. Dr. Ben, what's your question? Morning, doctors. Uh, my question is about stars and visibility. Uh, given enough time, like 100 years, 1,000 years, stars that are, you can't see to the naked eye, will they become visible? This is also an excellent question, and I'm sure Dr. Carl can pipe in too. But I'm, I, So I'm going to say no based on a couple of factors. Um, the way that telescopes deal with this is something called integration time. So the longer a telescope stares at a spot on the sky, the more light that it collects. And that means if I look at a spot on the sky for 10 minutes, I might see 100 stars. But if I stare at that spot with my telescope for half an hour, well, I'll see a lot more stars just because I am getting more and more photons of light. And so I can see things that are fainter because I'm staring at them for longer. But human eyes are no good at that. We can't... Um, integrate and catch those photons and kind of record them so that they stack up over time so that we can see them. And the other thing is the universe is expanding. So everything is moving away from us, excluding the effects of gravity. So it's actually more likely that we'll see fewer stars. And in the future. following on from that, uh, astronomers can call their light telescopes, they call them light buckets. Mm -hmm. So you get this bucket, you take it out at night and you fill it up with photons. That's the first thing. The second thing, the number of stars you can see with the naked eye is roughly a 1,000. And that was worked out by Claudius Ptolemy in Alexandria who got a bunch of mates and they went out and laid on a ground sheet, had some cocoa or something, divided the night sky up into six sectors like the slices of a pie and they counted about a 1,000 stars. So that's the number of stars that you can see all together. And will you... And there is a star that's brightening every 80 years. There are a few that change brightness. Yeah. And I should also say there's a really amazing space telescope, my absolute favourite space telescope, because I'm a ground-based telescope astronomer, called Gaia. And it has counted 1.46 billion stars. <gasps> wow. So that's a little bit more. But the, the experiment of lying on the on the ground and looking up, you could, that is one you can do at home. We often say don't try this at home, but you could do that one at yeah. home, counting stars. Yeah, do that little rug, little cocoa. That's another great date idea. Okay, Laura, <laughs> come through. 
Darren in Lismore, you have a question about the Tasmanian devil, but it's not the one that I'm instantly thinking of. Talk to me. What's going on? Yeah, hi. Uh, I was out camping um, in southwestern New South Wales. I had a big drive to get back to where I was going, so it was 4 a.m. in the morning. I was up, and I looked at the sky. It was complete no moon, so it was as crisp as you could get. Wow. And in my peripheral vision was an explosion in the sky. And it was a long way away. It wasn't in the Earth's atmosphere. I kept thinking about it. It was a long way in space. I turned to that point and the star that was in that explosion within two seconds just faded away and vanished. And I'm questioning, uh, it, was that a Tasmanian devil that I saw? Or is it even possible to see a Tasmanian devil with the naked eye? So for context, Laura, what is a Tasmanian devil in the space world? So the Tasmanian devil is not a class of stars. It's a particular one. The class is called luminous, fast, blue, optical transients. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I think Say we call them... ten times faster. <laughs> let's call them F-bots. Okay. F-bots. Um, <laughs> and this is a... a, a thing that happens, and and this is another one of these fun things that we actually don't know what's happening, which is just the best. We love that. So this, when a star dies, if it's a massive star, so our sun is not going to do this, but other stars do it, they explode. And then what's left behind is either a black hole or something called a neutron star. We've talked a lot about black holes already, so let's give neutron stars their time to shine. And these are really small, really dense stars. So they can be heavier than the sun, but the size of greater Melbourne. So the sun is many times bigger than the Earth, but this is a teeny tiny star just as heavy as the sun. So that's a lot of mass in a really small space. Hang on. So it's as heavy as the sun, but it's the size of the city of Melbourne? Yes. Yes. What? So you're squishing a lot of stuff into a very small space. Uh, but these things, these F-bots, we think that is it's a big flash from one of these kind of leftover stars after the explosion. We're not exactly sure how or why, but the particular type is called a magnetar, which is a super extra magnetic one of these. Again, with the astronomers coming there with the really good names, magnetar for something that's really magnetic, very creative. <laughs> um, and the Tasmanian devil is one of these. So it's an example of one of these things that flashed really bright. Now, I'm not sure if you could see it with a naked eye. Um, one of the other possibilities is maybe like an iridium flare from a satellite or something like that. So those uh, really bright flashes of light. The, the interesting thing here is that we're not good, and this is, goes for telescopes as well and astronomers too, we're not good at judging distance in space. So most of the things that we see in space, sort of the way that we think about it and even us as astronomers when we're pointing to a particular star is like taking a sphere and projecting it outwards and then painting the stars on. So we sort of talk in where it is sort of in a longitude and latitude sort of style, mm. but measuring how far things are away and, and judging them from on Earth is really tricky. So there might be some other options that Dr. Carl has too. Yeah. So, Dr. Darren, did it move across the sky or was it in one location? In one location. And it was like turning down the dimmer of a light that just slowly disappeared in that two seconds and it vanished completely. And what time of night, like close after sunset or close before sunrise or deep in the middle uh, of the night? It was 4 a.m. in the morning. When does the sun rise? About quick. six? Yeah. So, yeah, a couple of hours uh, before that. Okay, so it couldn't be an iridium flare because it's not close enough. True, true. Yeah, bummer. I, I, I think you, you – how about we agree you saw something? Yes, I wow. agree you saw something. Oh, and, my God. and there are lots of things that happen in space that – or it could even be something like a, a meteor that might be almost coming directly oh, yeah. towards you. So a shooting star yeah. usually goes across the sky, but you can imagine if it's sort of coming straight towards you instead that you would see a bright flash that would fade and appear to be in the same location on the sky. So, But I think – no matter what it is, it sounds very cool. And also I'm very jealous of the view of the <laughs> night sky that you must have had on a dark yeah, sky night. Awesome. Oh. I, I just had to take time to uh, admire it before I jumped in my car and started driving. It was beautiful. Sounds yeah. amazing. Thanks, Darren. We've got Ruby in Newcastle here. Dr. Ruby, what is your question? Hi, doctors. My question is, do you have any tips on getting into the astronomy career? I've always been interested, but I have no idea where to start. Excellent question. So the first thing is a Bachelor of Science um, and you can do that at a lot of universities and they're all fantastic. Um, I went to Monash University as my undergrad and that one has an astronomy kind of um, minor or a major that you could do. So that's a, an even better choice if you've got a uni nearby that has a lot of astronomy subjects. Um, and then you can do an honours in Australia or a master's and then a PhD. 
But some of the things that are in between those steps are sort of the the fun things and will give you a good try and some nice references. Um, There's things like uh, summer research projects. So if anybody listening is maybe a second or third year undergrad, there's a lot of places in Australia and around the world that will offer for you to come for eight to 10 weeks over the summer and do a real research project and often get paid too. So there's lots of little things that you can do to try it out and see if it's the career for you. So does that mean if you're at a university that happens to be nearby, which is very handy for your first couple of years, this would be offered by somewhere somewhere else in the world, not by your university. So even if you were way out in the middle of the sticks at a tiny university, you could still go on this summer project. That's right. So I did my undergrad in Melbourne, but I did a summer project at the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research over in Western Australia. And then I also did one in the Netherlands at the Netherlands Radio Astronomy Institute called Astron. So the usual thing is to, you know, get all the degrees. Um, But it's also nice to kind of keep an eye out for these extra opportunities to really do research. And some universities also offer, say, semester-long undergraduate research projects, where instead of doing, say, your university does four subjects, one of those subjects is a research project. So lots of universities will give you opportunities because research is not really the same as studying an undergraduate degree. I don't do exams anymore, thank goodness. Mm. You mentioned earlier as well, Laura, that you are a superstar of STEM. We've had previous superstars on the show like Tiani from South Australia, Dr. Teresa Larkin in Wollongong. And this is an initiative that really brings uh, female and non-binary folk to the forefront when it comes to science communication. What advice would you have for someone like Ruby who maybe doesn't see themselves in the science world that much, you know, beyond the scope of, I guess, maybe, yeah, the conversations like this? I would suggest that everyone, you know, if you're driving, just take a quick glance in your rear view mirror or have a look in the mirror. And I would say that you're looking at someone who looks like a scientist. We often see scientists who look a certain way. You know, Einstein is kind of the typical one that students go, oh yeah, that's what a scientist looks like. And I often do this exercise with um, primary school kids and ask them to draw a scientist and they'll draw usually an older white man with crazy hair in a lab coat, maybe holding a coloured glass (laughs) beaker of some kind. But I can, I can tell you that if, if, you look like a human being, which I'm sure you do if you're listening, um, then you look like a scientist. So I really, and I really want to also highlight that part of science is about the perseverance and the curiosity. So mm. sure, you know, being smart is nice, um, but a lot of it is is kind of having that curiosity and that drive to keep going because science is a lot, you know, it's not like I spend one week on a project and then it's done. It takes a long time. So that mm. perseverance um, and curiosity is really what's going to get you through there. So I'd say everyone listening looks like a scientist to me. Oh, Ruby, thanks so much for your question. Thank you. We've got Dean in Frankston here. Now, Dean, another hypothetical, which I hope doesn't happen, but what's your question? Hi, guys. Uh, My question is, what happens if you take your space suit off while you're in the middle of space? Carl? Uh, You will not explode. You've got a chance of surviving, as was shown in the movie 2001. So what's going to happen is that you've got air inside your lungs and none outside. The surface area of your lungs is around 70 square metres. The air pressure inside is 10 tonnes per square metre, so that's 700, well, 700 tonnes trying to push out. So what you've got to do is open your mouth. As soon as you go into space, open your mouth and just let all the air go and you'll probably stay conscious for about a minute or so. Your skin, your body will expand to some degree, but skin is made of leather and you'll probably survive. There has been or there have been two cases that I know of of where in high altitude testing in decompression chambers, people accidentally got exposed to virtually the vacuum of space in a very short time and they survived. So you would unfortunately die after a short period of time. Uh, but what you're counting on is that there's another space suit over, another spaceship over there and you're going to jump across the vacuum of space and they will get you, pull you inside, shut the door and crank the pressure up and you should survive. Does that make you a little bit happier? Yeah, well, I was, yeah, I was... Curious if, like, uh, you know, you had to hold your breath a little longer than normal or something, and no, that explains it. Just let the air out. I think I'm wrong about the surface area for a gas exchange as opposed to the surface area of your lungs. Call it maybe ten, uh, maybe five tons for trying to explode you. But skin's made of leather. Jared in Greensboro, what's your question? Yeah, hi, doctors. Um, I'm wondering if you can speed up or slow down the speed of sound and what would happen if you did? Ah, so firstly, we get free stuff from the sun, we get energy, and it travels through the vacuum of space. And by the way, when you are getting energy 
through a wire in your house, say to a little electric heater, some of the energy goes through the copper wire, but a lot of it goes through the space around it. Veritasium has done a very good video on this. Now, sound is different. Sound is just bounce, bounce, bounce. Imagine you've got a whole bunch of people in a line or a queue waiting to get onto a bus or at a bank teller or something, and you push the end one without warning, and they fall onto the next one who falls onto the next one. And so energy is transferred from one person to the other or with sound waves from one molecule to the next. So the closer the molecules are to each other, the higher the speed of sound. So to answer your question, with air, you can speed up the speed of sound by making it more dense. So maybe on a very cold night, it's a little bit faster. And if you want to slow it down, you just make it less dense. Hot day. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that works out. Yeah. Okay. We've got Tom in Nam here. Now, Tom, you read something recently. What was it? Yeah. Hi, doctors. Um, yeah, so I was reading about a giant water cloud in space that was like 40 billion times the weight of Earth. I was just wondering how that's actually possible when water is made of oxygen. Okay, so when the universe started, there were no atoms. Then, about 380,000 years, the energy level cooled down that electrons could join onto the cores, the nuclei of atoms. And so we had our first atoms, which were, and still are today, roughly 90% of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen and 10% are helium, and then everything else is just fairy dust, like a little bit of sprinkling. Now, a star is a machine that turns hydrogen into heavier elements up to element number 26, and oxygen fits in there. So when the first star started firing up, they started manufacturing oxygen. So you, then the star comes to the end of its life and it throws it out into space. It throws a significant amount of its mass into space as they get to the end of their life, 5, 10, 20, 40%, whatever it varies. And then you've got atoms of oxygen in space, individual atoms, which can meet up with individual atoms of hydrogen. And if you do it in a three to two to one ratio, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen, you end up with water. And I think that the important thing here is everything that we have here on Earth, we can find it in space because that's where it was made. Everything that we have here on Earth was, well, some of the things we make ourselves, I should say, we do make things ourselves, but all the atoms, so that whether they meet each other to, to form molecules, which is a different thing, but the atoms that we have, we have in space. And they're usually made in stars or at the end of a star's life when it explodes. That's how some of the elements are made. And one of our colleagues, Tara Murphy, she discovered that and the figures are a little bit rubbery, but when in 2018, 10%, 10% of all the astronomers were in a secret conspiracy not to reveal this, um, and I'd walk down a corridor and they'd stop talking, and they had the results of two neutron stars that ran into each other. When they ran into each other, they manufactured roughly a volume of gold, roughly 10,000 times the mass of the volume of the Earth, kind of ballpark figure. Does that kind of blow your mind? Mm-hmm. Thanks, Tom. Now, if you say that the, everything we have on Earth comes from space and is in space, does that mean, Dr. Laura, that aliens exist? Does that mean... Uh, I'm, I'm surprised this question didn't come up earlier. Oh, I tell you it has. A lot of <laughs> oh, people have okay. been texting in. They always want to know. <laughs> so I think aliens exist, but I don't think we'll meet them and I don't think we'll ever have contact with them. The oh. universe is so big and I know humans are pretty special and we're all individually very special, but we're not that special that in an infinite universe <laughs> we would be the only life. So I do think aliens exist, but the key thing here is space is really big, really big. So if I wanted to talk to Proxima Centauri, that nearest star, I would have to send a signal that would take a couple of years to get there and then wait a couple of years for it to get back. And that's only for our nearest star. The rest of the stars are very far, way further away than that. So, so those, those are your two takeaways from science today. Space is really big and you're not special. All right. <laughs> Dr. Laura Dreesen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Seriously, we've expanded our minds. So many great questions coming through. If we want to read or look at more of your work, where should we go? So I have a website. It's astrolaura.com and you can find the links to all my socials on there. But astrolaura, all one word, dot com. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Science with Dr. Carl and a big thank you to Dr. Laura Dreesen for coming through. She mentioned that she was part of the Superstars of STEM program and I want to shout out two episodes we've done with other superstars, Dr. Tiani Adamson, who is a conservation biologist, and Dr. Teresa Larkin, who took us through 
all the different parts of the human body. Search the podcast feed if you want to listen back to those episodes. Make sure you're subscribed, liked, so you can be the first to know when a new episode drops. I'm Lucy. This episode was produced by Sarah Harvey, and we'll catch you next week. Bye. Dave Marchese here from the Triple J Hack team. Hey, if you love Dr. Carl's podcast like I do, you might enjoy the Hack podcast as well. Each day, we bring you the news that matters to you, from the latest science on climate change to what's happening in politics and news around the world. The Hack Podcast. It's your daily fix of the news you need to know. Get it wherever you're listening now.